Thanks, Colin. Um, I'm Mike, and I'm the sales manager for Wales and the west of England. And today, I'm going to talk about work boiling. There's quite a lot of information within the slides, um, so I'm not going to go through each point individually. But the slides should be on the website by the time I've finished. So pop over, download them, and uh, you can go through them in a little bit more detail. So the bits we're going to be talking about are the materials that we use um, and the methods that we use to heat the work, um, why we heat the work, a bit of a process overview, enzyme deactivation, sterilization, evaporation, shrub formation and pH reduction, hops and bitterness, removal of volatiles, and then color and flavor development. So the early kettles were made by cast iron, um, but as production ramped up and people wanted more beer, copper became ideal because we basically needed to put a lid on it and a chimney. Copper had been really, really easy to work with. It was just the ideal material. And by the 20th century, pretty much all the coppers were made, made from copper. Um, in recent times, pretty much all of them were made from stainless steel. Uh, but we still refer to them coppers, as I've just done. Um, generally, stainless steel is a little bit cheaper um, and also gives better chemical resistance, so you can keep it cleaner. So there's a little bit of science to get going. We need to get the heat into the liquid, and there's a few ways that this can happen. So we've got forced convection, where you're basically pumping the liquids past the heating surface, as the liquid passes, it gets the heat from the surface and then takes it away. So really, really good from a heat transfer point of view, but can cause shear forces, which isn't very good for words. Nucleate boiling is where bubbles form on the, the heat transfer surface and then they, they dissipate and they go up and then they're replaced by more liquids that then bubbles and disappears. So you get a basic thermal siphon. As one bubble goes, it gets replaced and you get nice mixing throughout the, the surface. So that's really, really good for uh, work boiling and indeed, and that's something that copper was very, very good for. Something to be avoided is film boiling. So this is basically where the bubbles don't disappear. They stay on the heating surface and basically all attached to each other and they create a little bit of a film that's got vapor inside it. This basically insulates the surface, uh, the, the transfer surface, and causes quite high differential temperatures. Stainless steel is quite bad for this, which is one of its downfalls. So we get quite a lot of fouling on the heating surface. So the photograph that we've got is basically a, a colundria or a shell and tube heat exchanger. The steam or heating material goes through the tubes and then the work would be on the outside. You can see the, the, um, the fouling that's caught, that, that you can, that's caught that building up on it. So there's a few ways that we can reduce that. Um, we can use softer water, reduce any scale buildup. We can use whole hops rather than pellets. We can use a lower differential heating temperature and ex avoid excessive energy input. We can avoid grain carryover from the ton that's going to stick to it. Lower work gravities help, but most importantly, it's regular cleaning. And what stainless steel does allow you to do is use stronger chemicals. So you can use a standard cleaner on a kettle is going to be around about two to four percent sodium hydroxide. And you can also add a caustic booster to it that basically gives the caustic some energy and a lot more cleaning vigor. So it's a bit like adding a, a vanished oxid into your wash to get the vanished density of the waste. Other things are available, of course. So different ways that we can heat um, the wort up is using electric. So these are generally on the smaller kettles, um, quite low uh, capital cost and do a, a decent enough job. We've got direct heating that is basically um, using a burner on the side of the kettle that fires exhaust gas around it. Um, we've got steam generated from a steam boiler and sent around the brewery. 
And then we've got a hot oil generator, which is basically like a, a home central heating system. It'll heat oil up to around about 80, 180 degrees C, and then again, circulate it around the system. So that's quite a good way of doing it. So electric elements first. Anything below 40 bar four barrel, uh, you can get away with just a single uh, phase supply to your home. You're going to use about 20 kilowatts. Anything over four, um, you're going to need a three phase supply and you're going to be using between 28, 60 kilowatts of electric. You get using an element, you get quite high differential temperature. So you get quite a lot of color buildup and quite a lot of fouling on the element. And if you spread the element out, you can also disrupt the convection currents within the kettle and cause more localized heating, making it even worse. Now you can add a little power controller, so you can turn the temperature down on the, the element that reduces the differential temperature a little bit. And do remember to switch them off. Uh, we see quite a few instances where we forget to turn them off and bag them in the past. Um, we've got internal coils where steam or hot gases are fired into a stainless steel coil around the rats in the kettle. Um, it's quite difficult to control the heat on this. So again, you get quite a lot of buildup on the coils um, and the color formation, and they're quite difficult to clean. You've got jackets in the um, kettle base and sides, which is quite thermally inefficient. Um, difficult, again, difficult to control the temperature. Um, so you're gonna get burning and caramelization on it. And again, they're difficult to clean. You don't really get any vigor from these, so you normally have to have some kind of agitator in there to move the, uh, the wort around. So then we come on to calandrias. So a calandria, as we saw a couple in the, the photograph in a couple of slides earlier, is basically a shell and tube heat exchanger. So it's a shell with a load of tubes going through it. You've got the steam going one way, and then you've got the wort on the outside of it. So the internal calandria is still quite commonplace and they're quite thermally efficient. Um, they've got a few downsides, like the, the, co the copper needs to be quite full before you can turn them on. Um, so it can slow your downtime down and can also uh, reduce uh, your brew length. You've got to kind of stick to a fixed brew length. Um, and if you're just using thermal currents over the um, the surface like the, the older, older ones did, you can get quite a lot of um, caramelization on it. But a lot of modern ones do have a pump as well. So they'll start the pump going and then they'll bypass the pump and let it thermosiphon the heat system. Uh, external calandrias, you see quite a lot of modern coppers. Um, so this is basically the shell and tube heat exchanger outside of the um, the wort's pumped from the bottom of the kettle through the heat exchanger and then back into the kettle through a spread plate. You can start heating this uh, around about 15%, so it doesn't slow your process down quite a bit. As long as you get to 15%, you can start preheating the wort. What's quite good about this as well is you can send it back in at a tangent. So you can basically use it as a kettle whirlpool if you need to. So basically, if it, instead of going back in through the spreader, it comes back in at an angle and it creates a whirlpool motion as it's boiling. Then when you turn the boil off, that whirlpool motion allowed the truck to settle down at the bottom of the tank. Um, you can also bypass the pump on one of these. So you, you'll start pumping as you start boiling and bypass the pump and the thermostat. So a bit of a difference between those five. The main thing we're gonna look at is around the vigor. So you can see the electric, uh, the internal jacket and the internal coil have got quite low vigor um, and quite high color pickup. What that basically means is your CIP cycles, basically the amount of brews you can get through before you need to CIP is reduced. The electric element's quite low at two to three before you, the buildup starts affecting the boil. Internal jackets a bit more. So what are we actually trying to do when we're boiling? We're going to halt enzyme activity. 
We're going to sterilize the work. We're going to concentrate it by evaporation. We're going to reduce the pH, and precipitate unwanted compounds, extract bitter substances and aroma from the hop, remove unwanted volatiles, and develop color and flavor. So what we're actually doing when we're boiling is we're collecting the sweet worm from the mash tun and tun into the kettle. We then start slowly heating that up. So as the kettle becomes full, we're getting to around about boiling temperature at that time. It's ideal if runoff finish and we hit 100 degrees at that time. We're then gonna boil the work vigorously for between one and two hours. At that point, the volume's gonna decrease and the gravity's gonna increase and we can measure the evaporation rate from that. But I've got put hops in the flavor and aroma and we're also going to use about 39 percent of the total energy usage in the brewery doing it so really really intensive um, energy usage it's also quite dangerous it is hot and sticky and I've still got marks from 15 years ago of being burned from the work so you do need to make um, you do need to be careful when you're, you're doing anything around so before you're sampling or making any additions, make sure you turn off any heating or any pumps, anything that's agitated. And if you have got a modern system, it's really good to have an interlock fitted. So basically, as you open that door, it'll automatically cut out any pumps or steam flow or electric flow. If you're adding additions, add them slowly. As you're adding them, they can create a little bit of a nucleation point and create over foaming, or you can even hit a little pockets in there and again, some foam in the bottom. You can use early hops and anti foam to avoid any more foaming at the start of the boil and have written SOPs and make sure that staff are trained. The PPE is always a last resort, but make sure it fits and it's not damaged. And if you are using steam or hot oil and you need to follow pressure regulations, then make sure you follow them. So, enzymes. Joint runoff. And the, most enzymes are deactivated by the high sludge temperature or by um, raising the temperature of the, the MCV. But boiling will deactivate them full stop. If you've had any fungal beta glucanase or any amyloglucosidase, then they're still going to be active during runoff up to around about 80 or 90 degrees C. But boiling will stop them. So if you want to do a zero attenuation base, such as a brute IPA, you may need to re-add um, AMG back into the fermenter once you cool the work down for the enzymes to kick in again and to carry on converting the wort. So basically, once we're boiling, we've stopped any kind of, we've fixed the sugar spectrum. That's it. And any, anything bacteria-wise that's within the wort, we're also going to boil. Uh, we're also going to kill. So evaporation. If we held work at 90, 98, 100 degrees C without boiling or agitating, it would remain turbid. So we basically need to boil it and get a vigorous boil at that. Now, while we, can't, we can measure temperature, measuring vigor is a little bit different. You can't really do it. You can look inside a, a vessel and say, oh, that's a nice rolling boil, but what's nice to one isn't nice to another. So we do use evaporation rate to control that. So typically, we're going to boil for an hour, we're going to boil away between 6 to 8%, but we can boil away between 5 to 10% over one or two hours. As we said, as the volume decreases, the gravity increases, and we're going to drive volatiles up the stack. So basically anything that's in there volatiles is just going to go straight up the chimney. Now there is a little bit of a concern then that it could condense in the top of the chimney and fall back down into the kettle, which you don't want. Um, so there's normally a channel around the uh, chimney that will then take any condensate down to drain. You do need to check that regularly to make sure it's not blocked. And the word OG doesn't affect the evaporation rate. So to calculate the evaporation rate, we can either use um, volume drop or the SG increase. The calculation is the same for them both. It's basically your post-work figure divided by your pre-work figure minus one times by 100. 
If you're doing it by gravity, it can take quite a little bit of time to get the results because you've got to cool the work down. Um, and sometimes using hydrometers isn't exactly that accurate anyway. Um, and if you're using, um, it, it can be quite difficult when you, you're using volume because if you've got a, a sight glass on the side of your, um, your kettle, it's not particularly accurate to do it. So a way of, of getting it a little bit more accurate is if you get a dipstick, you can get a dip at the start of the boil and a dip at the end. And using a little bit of math, you can actually work out how much you've evaporated in that time. So you can kind of build up a chart of however many millimetres released the waste, how many litres, and you, uh, sorry, how many litres, and you, you can um, work out your volume from that. Now, larger or more complex um, kettles generally have a mass flow meter. It's quite easy to figure out how much seam you're going to use to, first of all, raise the temperature of the, the work from 78 to 100, and then boil it for an hour and evaporate a certain amount. So using a mass flow meter will basically put that in at a set given rate to ensure you get the right evaporation rate. And the boil, boil time does play a part. So an 8% evaporation rate in an hour is different to an 8% evaporation in two hours. So TRUP is basically the formation and precipitation of protein and polyphenol complexes. This comes out as hop rate. In the trub, it also contains salts, some resin material from the hops, and quite a bit of lipids from the sweet work and also hops. So we don't want too much of that passing over because then they can affect fermentation and bare foam later down the line. Trub formation is helped by the vigor of the boil, the rate that we add it, the system that we're using, and the duration of what we're boiling. And the optimum pH for the trub is 5.2. So generally when you fill, when the kettle's full, the pH is around about 5.8 or 5.9. And then as we boil, it's going to drop by about 0.2 units. If we want to bring that down that further towards 5.2, then we can add some lactic acid or phosphoric acid or maybe some calcium salts. The trub material is actually quite big. Um, Fat and that helps with sedimentation. Some of it's bigger sediments uh, quicker than something that's not. Um, but using shear forces can break up the trub and basically make it harder to sediment it out. So we want to avoid any shear forces, like what we get with force convection. And then when the trub separates, depending on what kind of hops you use, it depends on how you're going to actually separate it from the work. So if you're using uh, whole hops, you'll have the flower beds basically as a work filter, but keep the truck behind. And if you're using pellet hops, you'll have some kind of whirlpool that will basically let the truck sediment at the bottom and then you'll take that from a different place. Now the polyphenols are also going to complex with other uh, protein uh, degraded products. And these are going to come out during work cooling and form um, cold break. Now kettle findings really does help improve your, your cold break. It's basically negatively charged polymers that interact with the positively charged proteins. It's soluble in hot water, but then as it comes out and it gets cooled, it basically forms a gel that makes those protein, uh, protein and polyphenol complexes drop out with it. There's quite a few factors that affect the dose rate and how they work. So the one thing that we always say is do check your optimization every crop year but also different beers may have different addition rates. And if you, don't want, if you do want hazy beer, then don't add any finance. And always speak to your local rep around how you actually, um, always speak to your, your, your finance provider about doing the, the, the optimization on them. So hops, the alpha acid in hops dissolve easily and work, but we don't want the, I, uh, alpha acids, we want to isomerize them. So the isomerization process is influenced by the boil time, the temperature, what kind of hops we're using, with pellets or leaf, and when we're adding them. The work pH, alkali pH gives better utilization, but we don't necessarily want it when alkali um, works. 
And then hops, I did have to flame out. We're still going to have to summarize a little bit. So any hops that we had at the start of the boil, we're just going to get bitterness from it. All the aroma is going to go up the stack. If you want to bro brew any beers that are really, really light in bitterness, um, quite aromatic, then you kind of got to um, put all the hops in towards the end of the boil. Now that can cause a little bit of foaming um, at the start of the boil. So it's always a good idea to put some hops in or some anti-foam at the start just to control the foam. Um, over foaming as well as causing safety problems can also cause some head retention issue issues as well. And again, hops added at the end of the boil is still going to contribute. And it can be as high as 20%, especially if you've got a copper whirlpool and you do recirculate it. Um, once you put them in, you, that vigor does bring out the, the, uh, the isomerization. And it is becoming more commonplace now to actually cool the work to 80 degrees C before adding the late hops. Basically, by lowering the temperature, uh, we reduce the utilization and increase the aroma. So the volatiles uh, that we speak about, the main one is dimethyl sulfide, and this is basically sweet corn. Um, you get it in continental lagers up to a certain um, percentage, but too much is, isn't, uh, basically makes the beer taste a little bit awful. Um, it's formed from S-methylmethiamine, uh, which is found in all malts, but the lightly killed malts do have higher levels. And if you're looking on your C of A, It'll either be down as SMM, which is S methylamine, or DMSP, which is DMS precursor. The normal levels are below five milligrams per liter. You can also get grassy and grainy flavors from the malts, uh, jar and mashing. Uh, they go quite early in the boil, which is 2%. Um, any hop aromas you put in at the start are going to go after 20 minutes. And, but some of the uh, aromas from Hops can be quite grassy and vegetable. They take quite a bit of time to, to boil off and can take up to an hour. Now, what can happen as well when you dry hopping, if you then put some fresh hops in and you slurry it in, in 60, 80 degree water and then log it back in the vessel, you can bring out that vegetable flavour again. And we're also going to evaporate some volatile carbon oils. So DMS. The flavour threshold is quite low at 40 to 60 ppb. And our dash cells around about 70 ppb, so it is quite low levels. But it can be positive in, in lagers up to about 100 ppb. So it's formed from the thermal decomposition of SMM during killing and boiling. As we boil and we evaporate, it's rapidly driven off. But then, as we're on the whirlpool stand or during work cooling, it starts to form again, and any that's formed at this stage is going to stay in the beer. So if you want to reduce your DMS, you make sure you boil for a minimum of 60 minutes, limit the whirlpool stand time to no more than 15 minutes, and get rapid work cooling. It's important to remember as well the vigor comes into it, so your evaporation rate needs to be pretty high for that 60 minutes. If you want to increase it, then you'll do a lower boil time, around about 45 minutes. Increase the whirlpool stand time, so you encourage it to reform. It's around about 45 minutes. And you can also use malt that's got high levels of SMM in it as well. So we're also going to develop quite a lot of flavor and color. As we're boiling, we're going to increase the color by about two or four EBC units, depending on um, the color of the work you've got and the different makeup that it is. We're going to get colour from caramelisation of some of the uh, heating methods that have got quite high um, differential temperatures, like on the electric element and like on um, direct fires. But we're also going to get colour formed from Mayer reactions uh, between carbonyl and amino compounds. So if you do see a little bit of a colour pickup and your malt level looks okay, might be a good idea to just have a look at your fan level. Because the higher fan levels will generally produce a little bit more colour during the boil. The worst also darkens because of polyphenols oxidising, which we can um, minimise by keeping the oxygen levels low. And we can also pick up some um, sulfur, sulfurous flavours and 
some um, roasted flavours from the Mayabi action as well. And you can also get contamination from the beers. So if you brewed quite a, a dark beer the day before, then you do a lager later on, then you're probably going to get obviously that pick up. So you're probably going to get a, a colour pick up as well as, as the thing there. So that pretty much brings us to an end. We've put the troubleshooting guide in there. Uh, I won't go through it all, but it's there for you to have a look at with everything we've been through um, and the, the effect and what it means to the, the beer at the end of the day. So I hope you've all enjoyed that. Um, we've got some questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, as Mike says, there's an absolute huge amount of information in that presentation this week. Um, the slides are now available on the Crisp Malt website, so just go to www.crispmalt.com and on the front of the homepage there is the link to the webinar page, which will allow you access to those slides which you can download as a PDF. Okay, so to some questions, um, please do ask either in the chat box or in the Q&A box, um, just a couple. Um, so uh, just uh, one person looking for a bit of clarification. Why does Whirlpool stand time affect the SMM? So basically as we're, the, the SMM is driven off during boiling, but we, as soon as we stop boiling, there's still trace amounts there and it will reform the longer that we leave it at higher temperature. So the longer you leave it in the kettle or whirlpool stands, the more chance you've got of the SMM reforming as DMS. Yep. Um, so the same with, you, you've got your, your cooling to take into consideration of that as well. So you've got a 15 minute stand and then you, you're cooling down in an hour. Um, it's obviously an hour 45. If your cooling's longer, then you're just allowing more and more time for it to reform. Absolutely. So really, so when it comes to whirlpooling, it's just about allowing just enough time for that um, whirlpool action to happen for the trub to gather. And then really, as soon as that's, uh, I guess, as soon as the worts start, stop moving, as soon as that gathering process has happened, then that's when you want to start running off your wort. Generally, you kind of normally do it, SMM, if you would about DMS, you'd normally do a lager anyway, that has less hop addition and it's going to get less trouble for me. So it doesn't need as long a stand. Um, you can just get it out of the way. Very good. Um, question here about um, kettle finings and optimum pH. Um, I've read that kettle finings work better at a lower pH, 5.1 to 5.3, if I recall correctly. Do you have any information about that? Not at the top of my head. I think we said 5.2 on the slide for optimum uh, chub formation. So we're right in the middle there. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, if you get your mash pH right, then really the warp pH should follow from there. So I would always, I, I, I would, I would refer back to the previous presentation on mashing and optimizing um, mash pH. That's really where where the critical um, step is getting that right. Um, although you can, of course, acidify in the kettle as well if you've got a problem um, if you're not hitting your optimum pH. The kettle findings become around about well, the lower pH, they do work a, a bit better because as the pH drops, the protein charge becomes stronger. So they bind a little bit more uh, yeah, to, the, uh, to the copper findings. Absolutely. Good stuff. Okay. Um, what, uh, which is the better way of boiling? So we're talking about a relatively small uh, brew house here, three to five hectolitres. Open lid or closed lid? Ooh, well, if you've got an open lid, then whatever you are going to evaporate can't fall back in. Uh, but you're probably going to get a lower temperature. Um, John, if you put the lid on, you, you're going to generate a little bit more heat by doing it, just like when you when you're cooking it on, you leave the lid on, you get a bit more heat. But anything that you evaporate is going to fall back in yeah um, so that, like you said that that evaporation is absolutely critical so yeah. um you, you know you for small kettles where you know really kind of sort of almost brew pub sort of size kettles um i would just say don't don't fill them up too much because really you want you want that vigorous boil and you want the evaporate coming off um so 
I don't, I don't, I might bring Carl in at that stage actually and just see if he's got any additional, um, any comments on that, if I can do that. Carl, are you there? Hello. I am indeed, yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, ah, you can see now. Hello. Yes. Hello from uh, sunny Nottinghamshire. Um, yeah, I would agree with Mike on that one and yourself. I think with such a small system, um, I've got a little 100 uh, litre, one hectolitre system in my garage that I play around on. And I would always boil that for open lid because you do want to evaporate that uh, water and get those reactions happening. So that you're, uh, you're cleaning up the work, ready to cast it to the fermenter. So yeah, open top for me would be the choice. Very good. Um, which boiling method is better, electric heating coil versus steam-based boiling? Whoa, there's a, <laughs> there's a huge topic of conversation. <laughs> it depends on your system and how much money you've got. <clears throat> so electric heating does a very good job. Um, steam is really, really good because it can power other things around the brewery as well. Um, steam is ideal. But it's, it's a lot, a lot of money to put it in um, and run it as well. Um, whereas electric just does a nice job. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it certainly comes down to cost and practicalities. You know, if you're on a small site, um, if you want steam, then you're going to have to install. Well, first of all, you'd have to make sure you've got a gas connection. Not everybody has that or an access to some type of um, gas fuel, uh, whether that's um, mains or whether it's um, LPG. Um, and then, of course, you're going to have to put in a boiler, steam pipe work. You're going to have to service that boiler, make sure that it's supplied with soft water. So you might need a softening system. All of these things um, are required, whereas an electric element, you just you know, have the have the kettle heating up overnight um, for your hot liquor tank, and then for the boiling um, side, you know, you just switch it on, make sure you've got the electric supply. So um, there are certainly big benefits in having the electric at small scale. I would say. Oh, I would say that right. The oil, the hot oil, may be better. Right. The um, it's basically just like using a, um, a central heating system that heats oil. Um, to the, the, Costs yeah. are smaller than, than buying a, a big boiler and running it. Um, so yeah, it, and it's quite a good way of doing it. It's quite efficient. So that would be something I'd look at. I've seen some of these all-in-one systems recently, uh, around about the 200, 300, 400 liter size, and they use the hot oil system. Um, and it's a, it's a, yeah, like I say, it's an all-in-one. It's a mash tun and a kettle and a whirlpool. It's quite a clever kind of setup. Um, almost like a, a big homebrew kit. Um, and the hot oil, yeah, it does seem to work very well. And the, the oil is heated by electric, um, by electricity. Um, so you don't need the gas connection for that. Very good. Um, here's a question about whirlpooling. Is the best way to whirlpool to quickly drop the temperature with the heat exchanger to 80 degrees, then whirlpool for 15 minutes, then to heat exchange to 25 degrees? Yeah, if, you, if you're adding hops, yes. So if you're adding the hops for... Um, if you're adding the hops for um, aroma right at, at 80 degrees C, then as soon as you finish boiling, um, cool it down to 80. Yeah, I, I think it very much depends on the beer style that you're making. Um, of course, the traditional way of doing things would have been to add in whirlpool hops or flame out hops, um, and so they would have been bittering. That you would have, you would, you would get a certain amount of isomerization within the actual. Whirlpool, because remember that um, that isomerization process happens above um, 80 degrees. Um, but the the, the trend um, seems to be just now for for very aromatic beers with very very low levels of um, of of bitterness, almost no bitterness. In, in which case, yeah, you're going to have to find a way to bring that down to 80 degrees, um, whether it be through the heat exchanger. Um, somebody's actually just suggested there, um, I use 10% cold liquor addition for the same effect. Um, so it's going to be sterilized because the overall temperature is going to be um, above, um, above 70 degrees, um, but you're going to get that cooling effect. So that's quite a nice idea as well. So you're almost looking there to, to brew at ever so slightly higher gravity and do a, it's almost like liquoring back in the whirlpool, which is that's quite a nice 
nice way of doing it. So if you want that really aromatic, low bitter style, which seems to become very popular at the moment. Very good. Um, do keep the questions coming. Um, I have got one actually about um, about these about sort of any IPA styles, Carl, where you've got um, you know you you want that haze retained. I think maybe Mike alluded to it in his in his presentation. But what kind of things can you do in the boil to um, to keep that haze? I think one of the the, the key point is just not to copper fine. Um, I've had a few people who customers who've done that for the first time and they've just carried on with their normal copper fining regime and then they've found that they can't hold the haze in the final beer uh, because they've taken out too much of the protein and obviously one of the key things about those type of beers is, is getting that haze forming material into the grist so you want to be using oats and wheat those two work really well and uh, that will tend to hold your haze much better but just don't copper fine it. Yeah, you, you don't want to allow your, your trub to carry over because it can it can hurt your head retention. It can also cause um, raising fermentation as well. So yeah, you, you still need good trub formation. Yeah, and you definitely need that. Yeah, that, that is critical um, because there are other elements in there that aren't good. But uh, without copper fining, you will take some of that protein material through, and that will help hold that haze and make it nice and soupy, which seems to be the popular style at the moment. Very good. Um, question here about scum removal. I, I remove the scum formed while the wort is coming up to the boil. Is that a good idea? It's something that I've never seen before, but taking any solids out at any point is going to be good. Uh, but it can, um, it's got quite a bit of safety concerns as well, I would imagine. Carl, I think you've seen this, haven't you? Yes, I was in that with a few of my customers. and. Uh, I'm not sure whether their works are any brighter than anyone else's when they're casting to the fermenter, but yeah, like you say, it makes sense to remove any of that as soon as possible. And uh, Kevin, I guess the only caution I would say is it might increase the risk of an overboil. Um, so just make sure you get some hops in at the beginning of the boil just to try and prevent that or a little bit of antifoaming. Uh, there are hop based antifoams that are quite good to avoid. Any uh, issues with head retention further down the line? Yeah, Kevin, if I can ask you just in the chat window there, what size is your system? <laughs> he, um, he's, he does say that he uses antifoam. Um, okay, it's a relatively small system at 250 litres. So you do kind of have that ability. Um, but, if, you know, that same sort of proteinaceous material will coagulate in the break. So if you've got an efficient whirlpool, um, or trub removal system, then you can leave it. I know that a lot of home brewers remove it because it's really quite difficult to get, sometimes it's quite difficult to get clear water to get a good whirlpool action in a, mm -hmm. in a brew set up. Um, but uh, yeah, you can either, you're either sort of removing it at the beginning or removing it at the end of the, of the boil. Um, here we go, okay. Now, there's a question there, Colin, that you might have missed about adding spices to the boil. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, a uh, little bit of experience with that uh, when I worked at Sharps Brewery and we did use some spices. Um, ginger uh, was one of them. And it really depends on what kind of spice you're using, obviously. Some of them are very delicately aromatic. The essential oils will flash off. So I guess with any addition, adding below 80 degrees or at 80 degrees would benefit the aroma in the final beer. And... Another way of getting that spice uh, infusion is to put it in later in the process, probably in conditioning tank. Or I know some people have actually put the spices into alcohol, so they put it into like vodka, for example, and then they can add that back because that extracts all the essential oils into the spirit, and then the spirit flavors up the, uh, the beer itself. So that's, that's another couple of ways of doing it. But yeah, absolutely, add it in the boil. It will sterilize it too, which is a good thing. Um, but 80 degrees is the best because you're not going to lose all that precious essential oil. Yeah, I agree with Carl. I've got quite a lot of experience with putting orange and coriander into a boil. So, yeah, we used to add it right at Whirlpool stand, basically, and just treat them as hops. Um, yeah. 
if you do add it later on in fermentation, depending on uh, what you're adding, you can get vegetable flavours coming through. So yeah, just be mindful. Of that. So all, 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 it's always about maintaining those aromatics, really, isn't it? For so many of these these different uh, things, I, I kind of almost liken it to like gin. You know, those those really delicate aromas would be extracted in the in the vapor basket um, really lightly to, to extract all the oils and keep the aromatics in solution. And it's the exact same thing in brewing. You you don't want that vigorous boil driving off those. Um, driving off those aromatics. Um, we have a question on Facebook. Um, which crisp malt would you suggest for both the lowest colour and the lowest DMSP? I think that would probably be our clear choice. Extra pie. We've measured the uh, DMSP on all our malts and the clear choice malt tends to be the lowest one. So clear choice extra pale would be the best. And because that's got less polyphenol in it, I have indeed no polyphenol, because that's what it's bred for. Uh, it has no polyphenol precursors. You're not as likely to get as much colour pickup in the kettle. Uh, I think Mike alluded to that in, two, in his presentation. So uh, that's another good reason for using it. Um, good stuff. Um, somebody just asking for a little bit more clarification on aromatic hop additions. Um, asking, is ar ar aroma hops added at the temperature range 80 to 85? Will that give the best results? Um, I think what we're trying to say there is that it will certainly give those aromatics, but without the bitterness, isn't it? Because they can be added. Of course, aroma hops can be added at, at you know, just at flame out, just after you, after the boils kind of stopped, and also during whirlpool. Um, but we're just not really wanting the. We don't want a vigorous boil happening um, when you when you're adding aroma hops. Is that fair to say, Carl? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but also keep in mind that you can add them later in the process. So at the end of fermentation, as you're going on chill or in conditioning time, um, if you want a real bang for your buck, then that's one way of doing it. Um, I don't know if I cover it in the fermentation uh, presentation that I'm doing in the next couple of weeks. Um, if not, I would say add them as the beer is kind of going on chill rather than once it's chilled down. That would help. Um, and I think certain yeasts will help um, promote those aromatic flavours and aromas. Um, so it's, it's a matter of choosing the right yeast as well. Um, just an extension of, of uh, the discussion about uh, spices and fruits. I'm interested in doing a pale ale with grapefruit. If using grapefruit rind, when would you put this in the boil? That's probably one for Mike. Cause it, I would have thought similarly to orange peel, maybe? Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd put it in right at the end of the boil. Um, so basically, just so you've turned everything off. I use a lot of whirlpool, uh, I use whirlpools actually, so you've still got quite a good mix in as you turn the steam and the pump off, um, but without really too much agitation. So yeah, you, you keep mm. and you're going to sterilize it. Uh, just it a in, point of it. clarification uh, for me is like if you're using they mentioned peel there. Um, peel still got the pith beneath it. Um, ideally, if you can add any kind of citrus fruit, um, it might be better to take just the zest. So the out, outer part of the skin, because that's where all the uh, essential oils are held, in little tiny uh, globules in the skin itself. Because uh, yeah. the stuff underneath can be a little bit harsh and astringent. So It can be really um, astringent. It's not so bad if you're using dried stuff, but if you're using fresh, then I would just recommend using zest. Definitely, yeah. You, you can get some real harsh astringencies if you just go a little bit too deep into the fruit, and you certainly don't want to be using, you know, whole fruit, for example, um, because that that pith and that rind um, underneath the skin is 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 really very astringent. Um, yeah. Not yeah, juice and juice and zest is fine, um, yeah. but not not the yeah. yeah, not not the pith. Very good. Okay, I think. Uh, oh, one more. Hold on. Um, can we use a partial boil to increase the BU? I.e. a beer having 20 IBU, but it was expected to be 25 to increase 5 IBU. Can I use a partial boil um, and then add it to fermentation maturation? Not quite sure. I guess it's kind of like blending question in a way. Using a yeah, kind of. Um, probably the way I do it, there are 
um, commercially available um, bittering compounds that are derived from hops. And that those are derived in a way that will just give you bitterness. So you need them in very small amounts. I wouldn't recommend using them to add more than five BUs. Uh, beyond that, they might be a bit lingering. Um, but that's probably the way I'd do it. Because doing the partial boil thing might make things a bit challenging. You're not sure what you're introducing in terms of fermentables if you add that to the brew. So I would just go with the proprietary ones that you can get off the hop merchants. Yeah, and um, we've not yeah. done... Sorry, Mike, go. Yeah, I'd be looking at post-firm bittering for that. Um, or you do a full brew and increase the bitterness by however many units and blend downstream later on. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the only... That, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're doing a, a smaller brew, you can get so many variables and get yourself in a whole heap of problems. Mm -hmm. We've, we've not gone into a huge amount in terms of the, you know, hop selection or anything like that. We've not got into, um, or alpha acid calculations, but I would certainly always recommend doing your hop additions based on the alpha acid content of the hop rather than just on weight. Um, so that's going to give you consistent BUs throughout the year um, as you go through different batches of hops with different um, alpha acid contents and indeed different ages of hops because the alpha content can and will deteriorate as it ages as well. So, but that's that's certainly one to discuss with your with your hop merchants. Um, there we go. We do have one last question, but I don't know what firm cap is. Does firm cap help in boiling? Is that an anti foam? Has anyone heard of that? I've not heard of it. I haven't. I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid we can't answer that one. We don't know what firm cap is. Um, we, I'm assuming that it's a, it sounds a bit like an anti foam, but it certainly, if we are discussing anti foam, then it certainly can help if you've got a full kettle. Um, breaks surface tension, make sure things don't boil up. Um, but uh, I'm afraid we don't know what firm cap is. Um, there we go. Okay, I think that is us for questions. Okay, great. Here we go. So please do check out chrismalt.com for the slides of the presentation. Um, and then we've also, we'll also have the video of this, uh, of, of Mike's presentation up there in the coming days as well. Next week, we'll be covering fermentation with Carl. And then the week after that, we're doing something a bit different. We're going to have a brewer's question time. So covering all the topics that we've gone through in the webinar. We're going to have a panel of brewers and um, experts from across the malt, yeast and hops industry. The aim of that is really for brewers uh, globally to pitch your questions to us, any problems that you've had in the brew house, um, things that we can hopefully help you um, and provide solutions for. Then do email us, do um, contact us through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, or yep, uh, visit the website and fill out the comment form. We're looking for your suggestions and, and questions for that, and that's in two weeks' time. But next week is fermentation, and hopefully you will join us then. Thank you very much, and see you next week. Thank you. All the best, guys. Stay safe.